congratulations to the winners of Hildeen's 2021 8th grade Lincoln Essay Competition. We received 124 applications from all over Vermont. First, second, and third place winners were chosen from each of the four regions, as well as two honorable mentions. We set up the prompt referencing the unalienable rights in the Declaration of Independence. We then quoted Abraham Lincoln, who, while running for the U.S. Senate in 1858, said, If you have been taught doctrines conflicting with the great landmarks of the Declaration of Independence, if you have listened to suggestions which would take away from its grandeur, if you have been inclined to believe that all men are not created equal in those inalienable rights, let me entreat you to come back. We then ask the students to choose one issue that you think demonstrates how our nation either is or is not honoring the ideal that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Give three examples to support your position. Finally, suggest one step that could either further strengthen our course or get our nation back on track and explain why this step would be effective. And now, please enjoy the honorees reading their essays. Hello, I am Edith Lane. I will be reading my essay, The United States Does Not Honor Inalienable Rights for the LGBTQ Plus Community. Our Founding Fathers wrote that every person has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Inclusive in theory and practice, this didn't apply to everyone and still doesn't today. A prime example of this is the LGBTQ plus community's decades-long fight for equality. While there have been gains in recent years, this community still faces a lot of discrimination. One damaging form of discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community is conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is a practice where LGBTQ plus people are forced to conform to heterosexual norms. More than 700,000 LGBTQ plus individuals have experienced conversion therapy as of 2018. In 2020, 10% of LGBTQ plus youth reported being forced to undergo conversion therapy. 78% were under 18. Studies show this practice is ineffective, damaging to mental health, and violent. Those subjected to this therapy are three times more likely to develop depression and twice as likely to attempt suicide. Despite its dangers, conversion therapy is still legal in 30 states. Denying someone the right to be their authentic self denies them life and liberty. The right to same-sex marriage was a long, hard fight defined by protests, legislative proposals, and court cases. When same-sex marriage was legalized nationally on June 26, 2015, the momentous decision allowed couples who had been together for years to finally marry. Yet, in 2020, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas asserted that the same-sex marriage ruling infringed on the religious liberties and branded those opposing it as bigots. This statement caused outrage among civil rights activists. If everyone is supposed to have these inalienable rights, how could one group be excluded? Over time, public opinion has evolved. In 2001, 57% of the U.S. population opposed same-sex marriage, while 25% supported it. By 2019, it flipped, with 61% supporting it and only 31% opposing it. This shift offers hope that all people will have the right to pursue happiness and love freely. The transgender community faces continuous discrimination. Military service is one example. In 2019, President Trump signed an executive order banning transgender individuals from serving in the military or forcing them to serve under their assigned sex. Thankfully, President Biden reversed this order in January 2021 but many worry it could be changed by the next administration. Inalienable rights cannot be taken away. Basing decisions solely on gender identity is discrimination and violates these rights. Education is the first step to guaranteeing inclusivity. 
To ensure that the LGBTQ plus community feels seen and heard, we must teach about LGBTQ plus issues in schools to dismantle biases and stereotypes. 90% of LGBTQ plus teens report suffering academically because of bullying. Data shows that schools that include LGBTQ plus issues in their curriculums have safer learning environments and decreased bullying. Education promotes perspective taking, which combats continuing homophobia. Through education, we can make our country a safe place for the LGBTQ plus community. When each of us is free to be who we truly are, our nation will be closer to achieving inalienable rights for all. Thank you. My name is Josie Haley, and today I will be reading you my essay titled The Right to Love. The Declaration of Independence grants us unalienable rights, which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Since the document was written, people have questioned the accountability of our leaders to those words. What about the right to love? Love is a force that has been around since humans first walked on Earth's soil, but certain examples of love have been banned, criticized, and discriminated against. This complicated American past informs the present moment. The notion to feel accepted as you are in all your raw humanity is foreign. In a society that has been climbing the staircase towards LGBTQ plus acceptance for decades, did it ever occur to our forefathers that the expression of gender and sexuality is what makes us diverse? Life, the capacity for growth and exploration, is a journey we all experience differently. Discrimination is happening and the current laws are not adequately addressing the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals. More than one in three LGBTQ Americans face discrimination of some kind in the past year. Title VII outlawed discrimination based on race, religion, national origin, and notably sex. The question for many people is how well does the last term sex protect the rights of those who identify as LGBTQ plus? Quote, if the court decides that the law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, applies to many millions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender employees across the nation, they would gain basic protections that other groups have long taken for granted. Unquote. Liberty is freedom from oppressive restrictions and the power to act as one chooses. LGBTQ plus people often face public discrimination, therefore they are not free from these restrictions. As stated by The Atlantic, quote, 20 states fully prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, while 28 states don't, unquote. More than half the country would not protect the 10 million Americans that identify as LGBTQ+. The pursuit of happiness is the freedom to follow your ambitions and to freely do what makes you joyful. Many transgender Americans suffer from homelessness, unemployment, depression, violence, suicide, and issues that are connected to their response from society when transitioning. It is our job to protect people from getting hurt and make acceptance the foundation of our future. How can someone pursue happiness when they are neglected by their friends, family, or community, simply just for being themselves? Leaders must change policies to eliminate systematic oppressions for the LGBTQ plus community, which can result in a lesser quality of life. Schools must teach children to recognize the humanity in everyone and treat people with kindness. We have the power to change laws that don't protect people's rights. And despite the rapidly growing cultural acceptance of the LGBTQ plus community, there are still steps we must take to face the past and change the present. People deserve to be themselves in every aspect of life without fear of mistreatment. And words that guide generations after us have an impact. Though we are all looking at a different sky the sun that guides us is still the same. Hello, my name is Ellie Bedliger, and today I'm going to be writing my essay, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. Are these rights being honored? Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. These are the very words that our founding fathers wrote as unalienable rights. Thomas Jefferson, was the very person who wrote these words. He took the phrase pursuit of happiness from John Locke, an English philosopher. At the very moment that Thomas Jefferson was writing these words, he had over 600 enslaved people working for him. 
Our society is built on systemic racism from its very founding. In modern day, systematic racism still infringes on the fundamental rights of many people that live in this country. For example, one of these rights is the right to life. In our country, many people of color have been killed by people in our police system. According to NPR, police have killed at least 135 black people since 2015. That's at least 135 people whose unalienable rights have been violated in the most tragic way. Many people have heard the terrible stories of these people who were robbed of their rights. According to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, over the life course, about one in every 1,000 black men can expect to be killed by police. Risk of being killed by police peaks between the ages of 20 years and 35 years for men and women and for all racial and ethnic groups. Black women and men and American Indian and Alaskan Native women and men are significantly more likely than white women and men to be killed by police. This is unjust and does not uphold the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People of color are also discriminated against in our society. According to NYU, research shows that people of color are 20% more likely to be pulled over by a police officer than white people. This infringes on the right to liberty. Microaggressions toward people of color in our society happen regularly as well, which denies people's right to the pursuit of happiness. People will say or do something that they don't understand is racially hurtful as a result of implicit bias. These small things add up and create a society where there's oppression in the daily lives of people of color. Actions that could be taken to help prevent these things would be to have every police officer go through anti-racism training before being accepted into the police force. This would help police officers understand the racial injustices in our society. Also, there could be more curriculums in schools to teach kids about systematic racism, so kids would be more educated about these issues and take action. This would help undo implicit bias. In conclusion, systematic racism is something that is breaching the unalienable rights of many people in our country and that needs to be ended. These biases are some of the very foundations of our country. We need to educate ourselves about these things so we can have equal rights for all in actuality. Thank you. Are American ideals upheld in this justice system? It is said that no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. Nelson Mandela. If America were judged just on its justice system, how would it hold up? Are we continuing to uphold the values our nation was built on when it comes to our lowest citizens? No. The U.S. justice system as it stands is definitive proof of how our country does not honor the ideal that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Inmates treatment in prison is an example of the failure to uphold American ideals. Common practices such as solitary confinement inflict severe psychological damage on inmates who experience it. These are violations of these citizens' right to life and the pursuit of happiness because a right to life promises the right not only to be alive, but to live a life worth living. An obvious violation of the ideals set by the Declaration of Independence is the death penalty. The state taking a life is the definition of not honoring a citizen's right to life. And the state has taken many lives. 1,532 people have been executed in the United States since the 1970s. The mere existence of the death penalty suggests that the state believes that not all have the right to life. Perhaps worst of all is mass incarceration. The justice system has taken away black people's liberty, with a higher percentage of the black population in prisons than white people by far. Data from the Prison Policy Initiative shows that in 2010, the number of people incarcerated per 100,000 was 2,306, while for whites, it was 450. The Declaration of Independence said that all men are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. 
Black people also have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The justice system seems to believe that they do not. If America were to redesign its justice system to better uphold its values, its prisons might look like Norway's. Norway's prisons are freer and more humane, focusing more on rehabilitation than punishment. There is no death penalty. In fact, the most dangerous criminals can only be sentenced up to 30 years. But does the system work? The numbers show yes. Bastoy Prison, 75 kilometers from Oslo, has recidivism rates that have reached as low as 16%, drastically lower than America's. If America changed its system to be more like Norway's, we could truthfully say that we are the land of the free. The evidence is clear. The ideal that all have the unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is not honored by the U.S. justice system. If we were judged purely on how we treat our lowest citizens, the world would regard us with contempt for our failure to uphold our fundamental values. The Exploitation and Mistreatment of Migrant Workers in America Burns, blisters, pain, and fatigue are a daily reality for over 2 million migrant workers in the U.S. Undocumented laborers account for between 50 and 70 percent of America's crop workers, and in Vermont alone, at least 50 percent of our milk comes from migrant labor. From produce farms in California to orchards and dairy farms in Vermont, migrant workers are exploited nationwide. The struggle of migrant workers highlights the cold, hard reality that America has not honored the ideal that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For migrant workers, labor is a precarious combination of job uncertainty and workplace danger. In the blistering fields of the Midwest, migrant workers fight exhaustion, overexertion, and dehydration while working long, hard shifts. Every day, migrant workers are exposed to harsh chemicals and toxins, extreme temperatures, and pesticides. As a result, agricultural labor is the sixth most dangerous occupation in the U.S. In addition to the dangers of work, everyday life for migrant workers is constantly infringed upon by the fear of deportation, substandard housing, and unjust treatment from our government. Many migrant workers in Vermont face food scarcity because they fear going out in public due to their legal status. Without access to affordable housing, some migrants are even forced to live in their employer's barns. Shockingly, migrant farm workers in Vermont pay taxes to the government without ever seeing benefits, a reality that highlights the disparities migrant workers face. To add to the picture, the U.S. has increased its dependence on migrant workers for essential labor in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but increased exposure has caused migrant communities across the U.S. to be ravaged with fatal illness while being prohibited from receiving government aid and stimulus due to their legal status. For migrant workers already deprived of health care and access to hospitals, the pandemic has been devastating. Not only is the mortality rate in poor communities where they live significantly higher, but migrant workers fear that a positive test may mean permanent job loss. For the U.S. to move forward, some drastic changes need to occur. Our communities have a responsibility to ensure that all laborers, documented or not, have reasonable hours, a safe work environment, access to medical treatment, and minimum wage. We must push our representatives and politicians to affirm the contributions of migrant workers and continue passing legislature like the H-2A Improvement Act to include, include dairy workers in the agricultural work visa program and stimulus aid to address the injustices that migrant workers face in Vermont and nationwide. America has a long way to go before the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is meaningly is meaningfully upheld for all. The exploitation of migrant workers is a deeply rooted catastrophe embedded in the U.S., but it is time for us to live up to our ideals and promises. Juvenile Records, a life sentence to poverty. Elizabeth often ran from her molester. After confronting her mother's boyfriend, she fled from their yard. 
Moments later, the police arrested her and charged her in juvenile court for being a chronic runaway. At age 10, Charlotte pulled down the pants of a classmate. This jest ended in public humiliation when she was charged for indecency with a child. Andrew found himself in juvenile detention for stealing cars, taking money for drugs, and invading private property. Adolescents frequently make impulsive decisions. Research shows that 90% of juvenile delinquents do not reoffend once their young minds have developed. In recognition of this, most minors are tried in juvenile court with a focus on rehabilitation. However, in many states, juvenile records follow kids throughout their lives, snuffing out their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For 10 years, Charlotte's name lived on the sex offender registry, and her record remained entirely public afterward. Young offenders like Charlotte, many of whom commit misdemeanors, land on the sex offender registry, and anyone has access to it, including employers and school officials. Don Siebert, a district attorney in Vermont, explained, if you have to register as a sex offender, you have to notify an educational institution. She emphasized that any offense, even a misdemeanor that has any sexual component, can file, follow a child and wreak havoc with their education. Children make mistakes. They have the right to be forgiven, allowing them to pursue employment and higher education. The sex offender registry darkens their once radiant futures. Certain drug convictions prevent former delinquents from receiving student loans, further pushing these impoverished minors into the margins of society. Education guides them through hardships and opportunities, but without ac equitable access to college, they may fall into a dark cycle of crime. Similarly, in background checks run by 96% of employers, juvenile records can be accessed. When choosing between an applicant with a record and one without that history, many employers pick the latter, narrowing the prospect of employment for past offenders. In many states, juveniles must request that the court seal each of their charges by filing a petition, a process that denies access to their record for anyone except court and law officials. This onerous procedure requires understanding and anywhere from $200 to $2,000. But a reoccurring theme among delinquents is that they live in poverty and lack a supportive family to assist in this task. How is America a free society with children sentenced to a life in poverty and forever handcuffed by impulsive decisions they made years ago? If we want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all Americans, every state must seal the record of a minor the moment they enter the juvenile system. Every state must abolish the names of adolescents from the sex offender registry. And every state must recognize that childhood mistakes do not define a person and neither should their record. America is founded on the ideal that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sadly, the wealth gap between black and white Americans, police brutality targeted at black people, and the racial inequalities in the education systems all show how systematic racism still frustrates this ideal. The wealth gap between black and white Americans is evident, and it, res and it is a result of white privilege and systematic racism in America. While the median wealth for a white family went up 30% since 1983, from $110,160 to $146,984, the median wealth for a black family continued to stay low, with a record high of $12,000 in 1995 and a record low of $1,700 in 2013. Redlining and racist real estate practices often cause black families to be trapped in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Black families... Currently, only 44% of black families own their homes compared to 72% of white families. Over the last few years, the Black Lives Matter movement has illuminated the fact that innocent black people are being killed and mistreated at the hands of police.
There were only 18 days in 2020 where police did not kill someone, and 20% of the people killed were black, despite black people making up only 13% of the U.S. population. Black people are three times as likely to be killed by police than white people, even though they are 1.3 times more likely to be unarmed than white people. Tamir Rice was killed for having a toy gun. George Floyd was killed for allegedly using a counterfeit bill. And Ahmaud Aubrey was killed while on a run by an off-duty officer. These innocent people died because of the color of their skin. Though segregation in schools was abolished years ago, racism in the school systems is still substantial. Students of color are suspended at much higher rates than their white classmates, and on average do worse than worse on standardized tests. Two-thirds of minority students will attend schools that are made up mostly of other minorities, and these schools receive significantly less funding. A report by EdBuild showed that non-white school districts receive on average $23 billion less in funding than white districts. Despite having the same number of students, and for every student enrolled, the average non-white school district receives $2,226 less per student than a white school district. While systematic racism is widespread, there is much that we can do as a nation to combat it. First, we can better support low-cost housing and mixed urban housing zones to reduce geographic seg segregation. Second, we should put more funds into our education system and specifically target school districts with lots of minority students. Third, we should be reimagining our public safety by training police more adequately in de-escalation de-escalation tactics, implementing proven community policing programs, and investing in social services. With these steps, we can fight for the ideals of equality of opportunity on which our nation was founded on and that we all deserve. How the gender pay gap affects the unalienable rights in the U.S. The Declaration of Independence states that all men are created equal and have access to certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These rights are supposed to define what it means to be an American. However, they are not actually being carried out in our country today. The gender pay gap is an issue that shows how the U.S. is failing to meet these unalienable rights for all people. The gender pay gap is the gap between the money made by men and women for the same work. Unequal pay for women in the workforce illustrates that our nation is not carrying out the idea that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is unfair. It takes a toll on the mental health of working mothers, and it hurts the economy. To begin, the U.S. is not honoring the unalienable rights for the people because women who work full-time all year only make 82 cents for every dollar that men make under the same job. This puts women in an unfair position because they do not have access to the same life as men. Ultimately, women's work is not valued as much as men's and this limits their freedom and liberty. Next, unequal pay for women takes a toll on the mental health of working mothers. When women do the same amount of work as men but make less money, they feel unappreciated and become extremely depressed or anxious. In a study conducted by Columbia University, Researchers found that the odds of depression were higher for women who are affected by the gender pay gap than for women who make the same amount of money as their male co-workers. Depression and anxiety can limit a person's happiness and ability to live life to the fullest. Also, the gender pay gap hurts many Americans, not just women who are directly affected by it. When women earn less money than men, it translates to less income for their families and higher poverty rates across the country. These families should not have to struggle due to the gender pay gap. This limits the lives and opportunities for many Americans and does not provide the unalienable rights for all. To end the gender pay gap, we must make salary and job description reports mandatory for all businesses, especially in the private sector. If businesses are forced to report employee salaries along with their qualifications and experiences, government officials can hold companies accountable for unequal pay. In addition, we should educate children about the gender pay gap to make sure they understand that the work of women and men is the same and should be rewarded equally. This would hopefully help the U.S. get back on track and honor life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone, as stated in the Declaration of Independence. Equitable Access we all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but what we need to achieve that changes with the times. 
In the time of COVID-19, our internet has become a necessity to daily life. Your rural residents rarely have the opportunity to access consistent broadband internet. As many employees have been told to work from home, remote workers that live in rural communities' jobs are impeded by their lack of high-speed internet. Students are remotely learning, which requires a strong internet connection, and without it, they cannot get their education. Having less population in rural communities makes it more expensive per person for internet companies to provide them with dependable internet. Upgrades are less frequent and monthly fees are higher, which forces rural residents to pay more. Even if you can't afford these services, you may be in a dead zone because the internet is coming from cell towers, not cables. Rural communities are struggling with money to pay for food and other staples already. However, rural residents are still forced to factor the internet into their budgets as an essential for work in their student's school. Without a broadband internet connection, rural remote workers can't update their computers, which slows down loading. Teleconferencing without interruption demands a strong internet connection. Rural remote workers start to get left out of the loop and become anxious of being fired. Rural business owners may need two internet service providers to assure coverage without gaps. Homeowners are penalized trying to sell their homes when buyers want broadband internet. The home's value increases with broadband internet as well as the taxes. Rural towns with high-speed internet grow with business, newcomers, and funding from the taxes. Towns without sufficient internet shrink and are less competitive with decreasing tax revenues. Remote workers and rural residents aren't the only ones penalized for having weak internet. Rural students required to work from home are falling behind. Services are erratic, making online classes unreliable. Students can't access other online resources or submit work. Having more than one student going online in the household overloads internet, so neither parent nor student can work. In rural schools lacking strong internet access, Teachers are limited in their ability to reach out to students and provide them with adequate instruction. It would benefit rural communities if the government raised the required minimum speed companies have to reach before they receive funding. Other forms of internet are coming out that use satellite constellations to give high-speed internet to rural communities. If internet companies are held to strong standards and rural areas receive a high-speed internet, more people would be able to move rurally and the increased population could create more demand for the internet companies. In the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, our country needs to recognize the inequality between rural and urban internet services. If rural communities can't obtain high-speed internet, they will be left behind in our modern world. My name is Margaret Orton, and I am from Middlebury Union Middle School. I'm going to be reading Death, Incarceration, and the Pursuit of Whatever is Left. How dare we, as a nation, declare that all are created equal when in every neighborhood our black friends, relatives, and co-workers are treated differently than white people still today. To some, America's truths are that all are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To others, that translates more directly to death, incarceration, and the pursuit of whatever is left. Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude, Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, the list goes on. All black, all innocent, all dead. According to an analysis by Laura Bilt, quote, black Americans were killed at three times the rate of white Americans from 2013 to 2019 and black victims of police killings were more likely to be unarmed during the encounters." Unquote. Of those cases, only 2.6% led to charges and 1% led to conviction. Patrizia Rizzo relates that even in 2020, 28% of the people killed by the police have been black, despite black people making up only about 18% of America's population. Does this sound like life to you? To me, this sounds like death. It's not just the police shootings that show racism in America. It's also racial imbalance in traffic stops and incarceration rates. For instance, in 2018, black drivers were three times more likely to get pulled over than white drivers. Additionally, a Kansas report found that 28% of black males 25 or younger were stopped in a year, 
as opposed to 12% of white males. Reported quickly found that drug-related crimes have gone up by 36%, and it's not a coincidence that almost 75% of drug offenders were black or Latino. Does this sound like liberty to you? To me, this sounds like incarceration. Notably, many black Americans are only in jail because their employment options are so limited. For instance, a 2019 article explains that black people, quote, continue to face systematically higher unemployment rates, fewer job opportunities, lower pay, poorer benefits, and greater job instability, unquote. Black people are outnumbered by seven to 12 white people in fields like computing, law, and mathematics. Systematically, black people are left to fight for jobs more willingly provided for white people. And once they get them, they, on average, get lower pay and harsher working conditions. Does this sound like the pursuit of happiness to you? To me, this sounds like the pursuit of whatever is left. We need to understand where these problems come from in order to address them. One of the reasons black people get pulled over and even shot was because they quote, looked threatening. This idea may come from the fact that there are a lot of black Americans in jail. However, why are they in jail? Due to underemployment, criminal action may be the only option for some people to sustain themselves. All of these issues are connected. America needs adequate jobs that account for systematic disadvantages faced by black Americans in order to decrease incarceration rates and allow everyone to take part in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hi, my name is Owen Parker. I live in Hartford, Vermont, and this essay is dedicated to my friend, Alice Lockery, The Uphill Battle for Transgender Equality. The Declaration of Independence promises three unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The LGBTQ plus community, and especially those who are transgender, have struggled to achieve these basic human rights. Recently, the Biden administration signed an executive order to prevent discrimination against the transgender minority on the basis of gender identity, which is helping our nation achieve the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. This action reverses much of the previous administration's efforts, but more permanent legislation is necessary to protect their unalienable rights. Sports, military service, and healthcare are examples of the uphill battle still being fought by the transgender community. Cisgender children all around the United States are allowed to participate in sports with others that identify as the same gender as them. Biden's new executive order would allow transgender children to play sports they love as their identified gender. This policy has been met with backlash from many Southern states who say it would ruin the integrity of women's sports. How can we promise the pursuit of happiness and not let all children play sports as their identified gender. Transgender children need to openly be supported by all before progress can truly be made. Transgender people have always had to fight to be themselves, but certain workplaces, such as the military, deny them equality. During the Trump presidency, all openly transgender service members were said to be unfit to serve in any military capacity based solely on their gender identity. These heroes are faced with the possibility of involuntary discharge just for being who they are. With the coming of the Biden era, this issue has improved, but transgender service members have still not reached full equality amongst their peers. Healthcare is a continual battle for the average American, but it's even harder for transgender people. President Trump's actions against transgender people allowed healthcare providers to stop offering essential services to one of the most at-risk populations. It also took the right to life and the pursuit of happiness from the transgender minority seeking health care. The Biden team is now working to stop this discrimination with an executive order that calls for equality. Without laws, this work may not be permanent protection against discrimination. Our great nation needs to continue 
working to stop discrimination and provide equality to the transgender community. The most obvious solution to stop this discrimination is to erase the stigma surrounding the group with education. We need to teach children at a young age there's nothing wrong with letting people be themselves. Legislation needs to be passed to fix these issues rather than reversible executive orders. As a nation, we need to continue chasing equality, not just for members of the LGBTQ plus community, but for everyone. We need to continue this uphill battle for equality and never let the battle cease until all discrimination is gone. My name is Unandi Lungu. I'm from Randolph, Vermont, and I go to Randolph Union High School. This is my essay about immigration in America. Immigration in America demonstrates how our nation honors the principle that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness through programs such as the Diversity Visa Lottery Program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA Program, and the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. The Diversity Visa Lottery Program is a very effective program that helps immigrants get a visa. 50,000 immigrant visas are available annually through a lottery program. This allows people who come from low rates of immigration to America admittance into the United States. The individual that gains permanent residence will be able to work in the United States. This can have many benefits, like raising the economy, giving better opportunities to new immigrants. DACA can also provide the same benefits and make things a little easier for immigrants that are eligible for the program. DACA defers removal action against an individual for a specific amount of time. This makes them eligible for employment authorization, which can raise many benefits for both the DACA recipients and the United States. Studies have shown that DACA recipients are helping raise the economy by making large purchases and making states gain revenue through taxes. DACA recipients have also helped raise the economy through working. DACA recipients work in many different sectors, from health services to retail trades, contributing to all sides of the economy. Education is also a very important part of DACA, giving immigrants the chance to pursue many different possibilities. Overall, 40% of respondents are currently in school, a large majority, 83%, of whom are pursuing a bachelor's degree or higher. When it comes to educational attainment, 46% of respondents reported already having a bachelor's degree or higher. Importantly, among those who are currently in school, a robust 93% said that because of DACA, they pursued educational opportunities that they previously could not. This quote comes from a DACA article written by Tom K. Wong. Without these programs, immigrants would not have obtained better lives for them and their family. This idea demonstrates the importance of these programs and the positive impacts that come from them. The U.S. Refugee Admissions Program gives people that have experienced maltreatment due to a membership in a social group, race, political opinion, the chance to flee to the United States. The United States can allow entry to enable refugees to live a better life. Refugees come from many different and tough backgrounds, which is why this program is so important. By the United States offering such programs, such as the Diversity Visa Lottery Program, the DACA Program, and the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, immigrants and refugees can obtain better lives and honor the principle that all people have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness through the listed benefits of these programs by changing the number of immigrants that enter the country annually and the refugee admission rate. We can strengthen immigration in America and further honor this important principle. Thank you so much. Mental illness is a growing issue in society. The global pandemic has only made this an even larger one. Mental health is often overlooked when it comes to how someone can function as a quote-unquote normal person. It can affect your way of life, feeling of personal freedom, and your overall happiness. 
your mental stability can have a huge impact on your life. Having poor mental health can influence how you deal with traumatic events. Coping mechanisms are ways you center yourself after an event. There can be positive and negative mechanisms. Positive coping skills include exercising, talking to a trusted adult, or distractions. Examples of negative coping skills include harming yourself or others, drugs, and alcohol. Using negative coping mechanisms can only encourage your mental health to decrease, even if they seem to be helping you. Untreated, mental illness can lead to extreme emotional and behavioral problems. These issues can introduce problems within your personal relationships, friends, family, etc. Hurt relationships can overwhelm someone and make your mental health suffer more. Your mental stability can have a huge impact on your life. Having poor mental health can influence how you deal with traumatic events. Coping mechanisms are ways you center yourself after an event. There can be positive and negative mechanisms. Positive coping skills include exercising, talking to a trusted adult, or using distractions. Examples of negative coping skills include harming yourself or others, drugs, and alcohol. Using negative coping mechanisms can only encourage your mental health to decrease, even if they seem to be helping you. Untreated, mental illness can lead to extreme emotional and behavioral problems. These issues can introduce problems within your personal relationships, your friends, your family, etc. Hurt relationships can overwhelm someone and make your mental health suffer more. Mental illness can lead you to feeling as if you have little freedom. Mental disorders are considered to disrupt one's feeling of freedom because they can impair a person's ability to make rational decisions and lead to behavior which seems deeply out of character from that person. If given too little sense of personal freedom, you can feel trapped. Too much and you can make risky and underthought decisions. These decisions often cause you to regret what you have done. Mental health is also one of the obvious factors in depicting someone's happiness. An Origins of Happiness report says that getting rid of mental illness, such as depression and anxiety, would increase happiness by 20%. This shows that poor mental health can cause you to feel little happiness. Your well-being can also be a result of your mental health. In fact, your sense of well-being is another large part of how happy you are. When you have an increased sense of well-being, you're more likely to feel happy. There are many ways to help mental health become less of a problem. An issue you can help to eliminate is stigma. Mental health has a huge stigma around it. There are stereotypes that can make people with mental disorders feel like more of an outcast and cause them to think badly of themselves. If people around the country actively work to teach others that having a mental disorder isn't necessarily bad, it would cause a ripple effect. Getting rid of this stigma would help people with these disorders and could give more people a better day-to-day -day life, feeling of freedom and happiness. You're celebrating at Route 91 Harvest Music Festival in Las Vegas. Suddenly, bullets pour down from the nearby hotel. People fall to the ground as the metal pierces their bodies. Did these Americans get the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Probably not. The Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, was written on December 15, 1791. Why are we letting a document that was composed before semi-automatic rifles which were invented in 1884, tell us who can get access to firearms. The new world has new weapons, but American laws remain mired in the past, putting lives at risk. The USA has 5% of the world's population, but has 45% of the world's civilian-owned guns, and because of this, the highest homicide rates. When the Second Amendment was written, the fastest gun could shoot four bullets per minute. The loading process involved gunpowder, lead ball, and ramrod. If you compare that to now when loading and firing is simple and when a legal gun can fire 138 rounds per minute, you can see that the writers of the Second Amendment could have never predicted the deadliness of today's guns. Nor could they predict how easy it is to buy multiple firearms. The shooter of the Las Vegas Music Festival, Stephen Paddock, legally purchased 33 firearms from October 2016 to September 2017. Mr. Paddock then outfitted the guns with bump stock that are now illegal. Nevertheless, the standard magazine can shoot 30 rounds before rel reloading, and a special magazine can shoot up to 100 shots before reloading, and both are still legal. The Las Vegas shooting left 58 people dead, hundreds more injured, and thousands emotionally scarred, such as a survivor having a panic attack overhearing a staple gun. Neither the victims or survivors got the right to pursue happiness. The trauma of the shooting stays with them. 
Some of the survivors have not gone back to work because of this incident, and others have to raise children alone. Opponents of gun control, such as the NRA, state that if semi-automatics were made illegal, most law-abiding citizens would turn in their guns, but criminals would keep them, putting civilians at risk. If Las, in Las Vegas, if someone could have shot the shooter in time, one person would be dead, but 58 would still be alive. The fighting fire with fire argument that these places propose helps no one except them, the businesses selling the guns. Australia prohibited automatic and semi-automatic rifles, mandated more licensing and registration, and instituted a temporary gun buyback program that took 650,000 guns out of public circulation. Since these laws were adopted, homicides, gun deaths, and mass shootings have all gone down. If the U.S. prohibits semi-automatic and automatic guns, institutes a gun buyback program, and has heightened background checks, fewer people will die. This would be a step towards fulfilling America's promise to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all its citizens. Why $15 by Grace Maley. People always say money can't buy happiness, but is this true? It's difficult to be happy when choosing between paying rent or buying food. Our founding fathers wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How is this possible if half of Americans are working in jobs that don't pay them enough money to gain economic stability? The federal minimum wage is $7.25 per hour. This is not enough money to achieve life, liberty, and happiness, or even enough money to survive. For us to live in an equitable society, working class Americans need to be supported and valued for their work. The national minimum wage is roughly half of what most four-person families require to survive. The average four-person family needs a minimum of $26,000 per year to afford necessities. Someone working full-time at a minimum wage job can only earn about $15,000 per year. Workers must try to support their families with only half of the money needed. In 2019, the median house price in the United States was $257,000. People should spend 30% of their income on housing, but this is unachievable for many minimum wage workers. The mortgage payment is likely the only expense they can pay, leaving them unable to pay other bills or buy food. Housing prices are increasing. Meanwhile, the minimum wage hasn't changed since 2009. While renting is an option, hardworking Americans should be able to own property if they choose. Additionally, 53 million Americans are working in low-wage jobs. Most low-wage workers are adults between the ages of 25 and 54. The average wage in this group is $10.22 per hour, not enough for a family of four to live on. The unreasonably low minimum wage prevents millions of Americans from achieving life, liberty, and happiness. If we raise the federal minimum wage to $15 per hour, millions of families could have brighter futures. However, this does prove controversial. Some suggest that if developing small businesses are forced to pay their employees more than they can afford, it may drive them out of business and cost jobs. I propose a tax addition for the top 1% of Americans. Small tax increase should generate billions of dollars. The government could distribute this money to businesses that need assistance to pay above minimum wage. The minimum wage marginalizes working class communities and makes it impossible for low wage citizens to get ahead. Especially during the pandemic, America needs the ability to afford housing, food, and health care. Increasing the minimum wage will inspire more productivity from workers, promoting businesses everywhere. When paid more, workers will have more money to spend, advancing our economy. America stands for the ideals that all people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Will American leaders stand up for a fair wage, or will they stand silent? What an inspiration to us all. The message is clear. Students are paying attention, and they care about Vermont. To learn more about the Lincoln Essay Competition and Hildeen, the Lincoln Family Home, please visit our website at www.hildeen.org or our Facebook page, or come visit our magnificent 412-acre estate in person in beautiful Manchester, Vermont. Thank you.